Welcome to the introduction to developmental psychology. My name is Dr. Natasha Kirkham and I'm a senior lecturer here at Birkbeck in the Department of Psychological Sciences and I teach introduction to developmental psych. So today we're going to talk about what developmental psychology is. I'm going to take you through some of the background and the theory to developmental psychology and then a little bit of research. So what questions do we ask? Well, for starters we ask Am I like my parents? Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? And why? How do I learn to do things? How do I learn to drive a car, play tennis? And once I've done that, how do I then go back and remember that I've done that? Am I different from my best friend or like my best friend? And why has that happened? Have I, have I found my best friend because she's like me? Or have we grown together? Why do kids like peekaboo so much? or games that are repetitive. Why do they watch the same TV shows over and over again? Well, there are some good reasons why children like repetitive events and television shows and books. And what about atypical development? What about children with autism spectrum disorder or conduct disorders? What goes on there that makes their development different from typical development? And what can typical developmental research tell us about atypical development? So those are just a few examples of the kind of questions we ask in developmental psychology, from the brain up to groups of people across generations and within generations. So what is developmental psychology then? Well, it's different from other types of psychology because it's not a content area. It's not just about cognition. It's not just about the social world. It allows us to look at all of these things, but we have to study it across time, how it develops. So it's a study of change over time. It's the investigation of the origins of thought, of language, of emotions, of talent, anything that you can think of that makes us unique as humans. Effectively, it tries to answer the question of how we go from this in utero to this to this in four years. From having no words, from barely being able to think, to being able to, at the age of four, come up with a little story. This is the most you will ever change in your life, the first four to six years of your life. It is a fascinating and amazing time of brain development, personality development, cognitive development, social development. Okay, a little history before we look at our research. So this question of how we develop has been around for a very long time. It is a philosophical question that has garnered a lot of interest. In fact, in 350 BCE, Aristotle was one of the first people to reject the prevailing idea that the individual was preformed at the start of life in favor of thinking about epigenesis, which just means that development occurs. There is an emergence of new structures over time. Although what those structures were and how they emerged and where they started from was something that is still being argued about. And in fact, in the 17th century, there was a group called the spermists who believed that inside every sperm was a little tiny human and that all that happened was that the womb gave that little tiny human a little room to grow in. Not to be outdone, there was also the ovists who believed that there was a little tiny human in every single egg. So we know this has been around for a very long time, but recently we have been able to actually start to answer these mechanistic questions of actually how development happens. There is incredible new um, techniques looking at genetics and a revolution in embryology, which has allowed us to actually study prenatal development and has allowed us to look inside of the brain as it develops and think about how this interacts with the environment over time. But before we got to this, we had the great theorists. And the great theorists of our era maybe didn't have quite the information about genetics and about brain development, but still came up with some extraordinary ways of describing development. There's Freud, there's Skinner, Piaget, and Erickson, who over the past century have come up with some incredibly interesting theories of how we develop and why. Sigmund Freud thought it was all about your mother and most of his theory related to the, that first attachment, that first interaction. B.F. Skinner thought it was all about the training 
So he believed that he could take any child and with the right amount of punishment and reward could mold and shape a child into being any type of adult you can think of. Jean Piaget thought that you constructed your own development and that you were actively involved in constructing your own learning. And Eric Erikson really thought about what stage of life you were at and one of the few theorists to really go past the childhood phase and start to look at adulthood in an interesting way and aging. Across all of these different theorists though, there has been one main thing that is always asked and that is this idea of whether we're born with it or whether we develop throughout the environment. We may have come out on one side or the other across the decades of, of theorizing, across the decades of research, but it is one of our major questions. Nature or nurture? There's a lot of information out there right now that su suggests that there are genetic components to many of the atypical developmental disorders that we see. So that there might be, say, a genetic disorder in hyperactive children, or that children with autism spectrum disorder might have distinctive patterns of brain activity. And certainly this is very helpful and is very interesting. And we have been able to look inside the brain using fMRI and think about how the brain could be organized into quote unquote cognitive modules. And certainly if you were had it took a strict nativist approach, this is what you would think about. Modules that are available from birth that have specialized neural tissue. This is not a new idea by any extent of the imagination. In fact, in the 19th century there was something called phrenology. And what this is, is a mapping of the skull in which they carved out spots on the skull and said this is where these certain capacities occur. So for example, right about here, if you had a bump, it meant you were very curious, and if it regressed, it meant you weren't very curious. And I believe there's something to do with love. I think it's actually somewhere near your ear, right about here. Now this is completely wrong. This doesn't work. It's nothing to do with your skull. But in fact, there are there's quite a bit of evidence that suggests that we can map the mind out by looking at the brain in these types of ways. We can think about pleasure areas and language areas and areas in the frontal cortex that may be underlying more executive or um, uh, control types of capacities, like thinking about the future, working memory, these kinds of things. But we have to ask if this is useful for discussing development. How do our brains become so localized is a question we probably should be asking because we know that babies have a more flexible, more plastic brain than adults do. We know this because they recover from damage much more easily than adults do. So are they hardwired from the beginning? And if so, when is the beginning? Is it right at birth? Is it in utero? Or do they develop? And if we ask the question, do they develop, we can then ask, how are they developing? Is it just the environment. And people from a strict nurture perspective would suggest that actually you can learn everything you need to know just by interacting with your environment and by watching and interacting with other people. We believe that it is probably an interaction of the two. That it isn't either one way or the other. It isn't just cognitive modules and it isn't just watching. What it is, is that perhaps we come into the world with a brain that allows us to organize the information that's out there and allows us to find meaningful units in our environment. It is a gradual localization of cognitive processes. And now the question is, how does the localization occur? And what's the weighting between brain and behavior, genetics and environment? Now that I've given you a little background into developmental psychology, some of our questions and some of the themes, let me introduce you quickly to two um, bits of canonical research. One is called object permanence and the other is theory of mind. Object permanence just means understanding that things continue to exist after they've been hidden. This seems really simple, but in fact it is not something that is very easy for a baby. And you will see this when I show you this six month old. So you can see a six-month-old here who has an object that is very desirable. Once you hide that object, however, this six-month-old no longer knows that it's there. And this is not because he has grown bored of this object or he does not want to see it again, because once that object is uncovered, he's very happy to see it again. And this is a very typical response for a six-month-old.
the idea that these tangible objects continue to exist when they're not there is something they actually have to learn. Something else that we talk about in cognitive development, and this is with an older age group, is the understanding of other minds. So I introduced you very quickly to object permanence, and that's just understanding that things continue to exist when you can't see them. Tangible things, things in the world. Well, how about understanding that other people have minds when you can't even really tangibly get to grips with your own mind? How do you understand that people have thoughts like ours or different from ours, have different perspectives? The understanding of minds is something that is incredibly difficult and it is something we continue to have difficulty with even as adults. If you think about the last time you had an argument and you had to tolerate someone else's perspective, you'll get an idea about what I mean when I say we really have to think about our theory of mind over time. This is quite a busy slide, so I'll just direct you quickly to the main point, which is that by the time you're three, although you can understand that your beliefs and your desires affect behavior, what you can't understand is that your beliefs could change over time and that you could validly hold two diametrically opposite beliefs at different times. That's quite a hard thing to come to grips with. I'll quickly show you a little task in which a child is shown an object that usually contains something, very pleasant in this case, Smarties, but when opened up, suddenly contained pencils. And the question is, can the child look back at their previous belief and understand that they had held it. This is a nice video, and you may see one little boy do this. Juice box. What's in the box? Juice. <laughs> Look at that. What are they? Ropes. Jacob calls the ribbons ropes, which is fine. So this little boy has identified that there wasn't juice in the box. See, that is what actually happens across all three-year-olds, for the most part, is that even though they have just told you there was juice in that box, when they're asked again a few seconds later, they will tell you over and over that in fact they always knew that there were ropes or ribbons in that box. It's this inability to switch back and forth between two different thoughts, two different beliefs, that is very difficult for children at this age. So what does this mean? As you get older, it gets easier to understand other perspectives and to be objective. However, remember, think back to tolerance. So this is a life course development. And certainly refocusing attention becomes easier, although not perfect, depending on context. And so as we develop, we get better at many, many capacities. We learn, our learning becomes more complex, our thinking becomes more complex, but it is quite incredible to watch the leaps and bounds during the first, say, six years of life.